we recognize that the music community is made up of all sorts of people. This is not the symphony that we're at tonight. We encourage you to voice your approval, your disapproval, your boos, your hisses, your applause, wherever you see fit. Again, I just want to point out, thank you very much for coming. This is very important, and um, your participation in local politics will help shape the future of this city. So thank you again. Now, to get things started, we're just going to go through the panel. I would love to ask both Paige and Mike a question, but they opted to not be here this evening. So we're going to start with you, my friend Nick Licata. What CDs do you currently have in your CD player? <coughs> Um, I don't have a CD player. <laughs> Nick, what do you got on your turntable? I know, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> it's broken, actually. An, an MP3 player, man? You have an MP3 player? Yeah. How about your iPod? <laughs> oh, uh, no, actually, the shins. The shins, wow. Darlene, how about you? I have in my CD player uh, right now Elvis gospel music. Oh, nice. Richard, I'm wondering from you what the last concert or live show you attended was. It was probably um, at Jazz Alley. Um, I believe it was, I want to say I'm a Jamal, but that's not right. But it would have been a jazz show at Jazz Alley probably about three months ago. Excellent, excellent. Dwight, how about you? What was your last show? I saw Steve Earle in Seattle in February, and the next night went and saw him up in Vancouver. Wow. Does he know you're following him? What's that? Does he know you're following him? Steve Earle's fantastic. <laughs> Robert, what have you got in your CD player right now? Kind of blue Miles Davis. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jan, we're all dying to know what your last live show was. <laughs> Lyle Lovett, Sunday night at South Lake Union, music at the, well, it's not at the pier, but at South Lake Union. The new venue. Yeah. How was traffic? No problem. Huh. She took the monorail. Does the monorail go there? <laughs> Casey, I'm dying to know what's in your CD player right now. Uh, the new Van Morrison album. Oh, very good. Richard Conlon, I'm torn here. I don't know whether to ask you about your favorite band, what's in your CD player. So I'm gonna go with, what was your last live show you attended? Uh, it was Children of the Revolution. Great stuff. Yeah. Supporting local musicians, very good. And on hell, what are you listening to these days? What's in your CD player? Well, I, I have put my own world music as well as ABBA, because I have a daughter who loves it. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm learning all the songs, believe it or not. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And Linda, I would like to know what the last show or live musical performance you saw was. It was a uh, really great um, acoustical guitar and singer uh, that I saw up at a small coffee shop in Port Townsend. They were really Very nice. wonderful. Very nice. Well, I think this gives you a little tiny, tiny idea of our candidates. Please, again, look at their bios that are on all your chairs. You'll find out a lot more information. Now, I would like to introduce uh, Josh Fite, who is the news editor at The Stranger. <laughs> And he is going to begin our panel with the first question. Thank you. Um, I don't know who the first person that gets to answer it is, but I'll just ask it. Um, so downtown urban density is uh, a policy priority for the city right now. And um, so as a council member, you're likely to face the following scenario, which is that um, a club which doesn't have, which has a history of not very many noise complaints, um, is going to start getting noise complaints or might start getting noise complaints from new neighbors who start moving into the area. So you've got a long time club, new neighbors come in uh, under the sort of new de density policy and start complaining about noise. And um, the neighbors are going to come to your offices and complain and the club owners are going to come to your offices and complain that the complaints are unfair. Um, so. The question is, what specific solutions would you propose to the two parties, and would you favor new laws to deal with this uh, issue? 
And Carrie, who should answer the question first? I'll be happy to start. What? what? I'll pick. Um, let's go down and start at the other Why end. Go ahead Jan, and start Jan. At the other okay, end. I'll be happy to start on this one. I've lived downtown since 1982. And, in fact, the city of Seattle has zoned downtown um, with incompatible uses. Every place you live, you're going to deal with some noise. <coughs> and we've chosen for the last 13 years to live at the King by the stadiums. That was a choice. Prior to that, I lived at Pike Place Market and Denny Regrade. And I was president of the Denny Reed Great Crime Prevention Council when there were a lot of issues about um, clubs in the Denny Reed Great. And I convened the owners of the clubs and the residents to try to resolve those issues. But the way I look at it is, if you want peace and quiet, you better live in the suburbs. Because if you want to live downtown, you're going to deal with noise. And even if you live in, this, in the neighborhoods of Seattle, you're probably going to deal with noise on occasion uh, related to a street festival or um, another kind of um, festive event. That's what makes Seattle great, our special events and all of the venues that we offer. Wait, and let me just add one thing. No, two minutes so, is up, Jan, sorry. Well, you move there making a choice, and you know what's there before you move there. Casey? I agree with a lot of that. I also like the idea of an entertainment district. I like uh, zoning uh, and building rules that um, take care of some of this problem by building in uh, noise baffling. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, Jan's correct. If you want to live in the downtown area, uh, you're going to have a little bit of noise. There's a lot of good that comes with that, and that's your choice. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I agree with the basic principle that's been enunciated, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. And the way in which I would solve the problem is I would try and bring the two sides together, figure out what is the nature of the problem, how significant is this, is there a way in which the two sides can find a way in which to live together? Some of that might involve, for example, the kind of uh, standards that uh, might be able to be met by uh, the building code being changed so that you would be able to have better noise baffling, better noise uh, walls to uh, insulate people. Uh, does the, the code things, not have that now or does it? It has some, but we might need to look at that and see if there are some things that could be changed in that to improve it for future developments. Probably wouldn't apply to existing ones. Uh, so that would be one kind of solution that you might be able to put in place as a physical solution that would help people. Uh, but the other thing I've experienced is that when neighbors get to know each other, a lot of times there's conflicts that emerge because people really don't understand and know what's happening with each other's uh, things that they're doing. And my observation is that when you bring people together and give them a chance to get to know each other so that the residents will understand why it is that the club has noise and what the club's philosophy and policy is and how they try to operate and so that the club owner will understand what the neighbors are looking for. In many cases you'll find that you can find a solution that actually is not going to hurt either of those two sides but is going to be actually compatible. And my suspicion is that if all goes well you might find that some of the neighbors wind up coming into the club and you might find that uh, some of the folks from the club wind up moving into the neighborhood. And that would be the ideal solution, where you actually have people living together, not just because they're tolerating each other, but because they've actually found a way in which to enjoy each other's presence. Thank you, Richard. On health? Thank you. I agree with uh, <clears throat> what uh, Richard said. I do not agree with uh, my opponent on the left side of the table. <laughs> I think, I think uh, she stated that we have to create an exclusive city, and I don't believe we have to create an exclusive city in order to live in harmony. We can put together, as a person who has a vision for Seattle, we can put together in a holistic approach. It is not only to do and create laws and create new laws and new regu regulations. We have to put together, we have to live in harmony, and we have to be visionary in order to, uh, to be amicable to each other. 
And uh, one of the, the things that I would like to do is to make sure that whichever club, whichever um, uh, music is playing in any club, there is new regulations in regard to the building codes. If we do that, I think it is uh, very likely that we create a very strong community in arts, in music, and in every way we can could What kind of live. building codes? What? Well, soundproof will be a, a best way to, to go. Uh, there are many, many clubs that are underground, and uh, not necessarily every building has to go underground, or every club, but uh, we can soundproof and make sure that everybody gets respected at all levels. Thank you. Linda? Well, another issue that's not been talked about, I think that downtown is under a lot of pressure right now, especially Belltown and some of the places that traditionally were the places you went to for affordable clubs are being driven out because property values are skyrocketing. And I think we need to start talking about rent control so that bars and some of the smaller club owners can stay in there because that's where you're going to get your quality. The other thing is, is that when we build high-rise condos, certainly the neighbors need to understand that you know, this is a place for clubs and music venues and all that. Um, an ombudsman, I don't think the city has one, might be um, something that could be established where when conflicts do happen, I agree with the um, point that people usually when they get together can work things out. And there are just certain standards that we should probably adhere to. After two o'clock, you know, you gotta quiet down. I think that's reasonable. Um, certainly tougher standards for the developers, more noise, noise control to prevent noise control. And, um, I think those are the mo main things, but just the other thing is, is that the other thing about rent control is what you're seeing is, is that the higher income people are driving the interests, and we've seen that on the city council. Thank you. It's hard to see out here, you guys. Um, so it gets back to making sure that people of lower income and working class have equal weight and equal say in the kinds of policies that are being set for downtown. Thank you. Just a reminder, audience questions, please bring them forth. Nick, we're gonna go over to you now. Okay, um, what we're having right now in, in downtown is, as was pointed out, we've got the goal of increasing the population downtown, and the second goal should be to make sure that we have the entertainment retained in downtown and that we support it. So I think what we need to do is a number of steps. One, when people move downtown, the realtor should be providing them a statement that says, you are moving into a downtown area. This is not the suburbs. You should be expecting higher levels of noise outside. Secondly, um, when we look at, we should have design review, which we have right now, but they have to look at design review of new buildings going downtown to make sure that they have uh, not open air windows next to uh, existing clubs, making sure that the standards for baffling is higher, things of that sort. The third thing is we need to look, work with the clubs. Um, sometimes clubs will have um, open doors or open ventilation on the roofs, things of that sort. They're unaware of the impact. So we need to communicate with them on how they can help manage their noise within it. Also, uh, many of these are small businesses on the margin. If we can make huge investments of millions of dollars in South Lake Union, we should be able to create a loan pool fund with low interest so that way small businesses that operate clubs can uh, receive the funds they need to make the modifications so that they do become compatible with the neighbors. And last, thank you. And lastly, um, we need to create a mixed use advisory group which I've been working with actually the mayor's office and SPD. They've already had several meetings. I predict that this will be created within the next three to four months. It's a long process, but you actually get together and work out issues together, much in what was talked about before. It's worked in other cities. It can work here. It just takes leadership. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Darlene? Um, I'm Darlene Maidenwald, and I'm running for position two of city, uh, Se Seattle City Council. Uh, I'm a businesswoman in here in Seattle, and, I, and also around the state, but I, have, I work with clients who need or want to 
uh, site projects. And the first thing I do is act proactively. I don't wait, I wouldn't wait as a city council person, wait for a complaint to come to me. I would know that a building was going in. I would go out and see what the land use was and see if there was going to be potential conflicts. Then I would get to be, be pulled together then before there's complaints. They get together and talk about their design, the other's needs. And I also would have a Seattle Music Scene Advisory Committee um, made up of uh, some of you out there to advise me on how best to be in a mixed use building and, and I, or mixed use neighborhood. And Nick, I really think that's a great idea to have some of the money from South Lake Union come to help the, the music scene in Belltown and other areas um, to help upgrade and soundproof and do whatever it takes, because that takes money. You know, I'm a small business person too, and I pay B&O taxes, and I know I work on the margin as well. So I would get your advice early on, and we'd problem solve early on before it came to the complaint stage. Thank you. Richard? Oh, thank you. Um, my feeling is if you want to live in a cosmopolitan area, then you better learn to understand what it is because it's been there, it's going to be there, and we would like to keep it there. I also agree with Nick in that what I think is if, in fact, we have current noise standards that can't be met and they create a problem, bring the people together, but I think our economic development office ought to put together some kind of uh, low interest loan fund for those people operating on margins that are too small to be able to do it, and if we're going to have more requirements put on those people than they've had when they've been there, we ought to help them figure out a way how to finance it. Thank you. Dwight? Um, a lot has been said. I would follow up on what uh, Nick offered in terms of mediation. I think the city of Seattle has a, a, a disturbing tendency, and frankly the city council's part of this, to solve all problems with a new ordinance, uh, new regulations, and um, I think that's just too uh, brittle a tool to use in this case, and I think mediation uh, is a far more um, uh, intelligent uh, approach to conflicts between neighbors and clubs on the issue of noises. Uh, the clubs are small businesses and regulations tend to drive up costs uh, for small business and drive small businesses kind of crazy. So I would hope that the city would establish uh, a mediation uh, uh, panel or uh, that had representatives of neighborhoods and representatives of uh, the uh, clubs and that it would be a permanent uh, mediation body and that um, not so much that disputes would go there to be resolved, but the disputes would go there to be sort of hashed over and see if we can't solve this problem through discussion rather than legislation. Thank you. And Robert, we'll finish up with you on this question. Great. I'm Robert Rosencrantz running for position eight. And my vision of downtown is to have an active, vibrant uh, community where people of all incomes can live. There's both a place for those who are pursuing their passions in creative endeavors, which normally means they're starving artists, and, and those who have made their marks financially are, and are going to be moving into some of the high-rise buildings, which are going to be at prices inaccessible to many of those artists. And also with new technology should be built in a way that they're largely soundproof. Sound technology has evolved a lot over the years. My experience in working downtown uh, includes when I uh, put together the preservation of the Rivoli Apartments, uh, 47 units, that houses largely ar artists of very, very low incomes, under 30% of median income. And the noise issue was a constant. There were clubs nearby. The dialogue that had to be ongoing between the Seattle Police Department and the city and the residents, I thought was a reasonably good one. The process works, and I, I, I th see additional legislation as perhaps being counterproductive because it tends to separate the parties. We have an environment in Seattle where people generally can get along and sometimes they need, need a little nudge from their elected leaders, but that should be there. We want to be a place of, of a vibrant evening and thriving environment. We don't want to be Cleveland where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame closes at 6 o'clock in the evening. So we can make it happen. Thank you. I want to thank all the panelists, or all of the candidates, for sticking to the time limits. Um, I should have pointed out that we do have DJ El Toro here. And should anyone run excessively over time, he will cue the music. And God only knows what he'll play. So um, we're going to go on to the lightning round for this question. Can follow up or are we bored with this? Um, yeah, we're bored. We're going to go to the lightning round. Okay. 
We're going to go to the lightning round. Um, Josh has a lightning round question for you. We're going to reverse the order. I do? <laughs> yeah, you do. Okay. Do you see it? <laughs> We're um, going to reverse the order. So I'm doing quest lightning round question two. I'm going to let you do uh, <laughs> lightning round question one. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. I wasn't quite ready for that. Oh, okay. But I'll do um, it anyway. Um, would you so like me to do it? I'll, I'll do it. Um, um, and this is a yes or no response, please, candidates. We're going to start reverse order with you, Robert, in the corner. And come around. Okay. Um, so the uh, partially city-funded all-ages venue, uh, the Vera Project, um, has a capital campaign to raise over $300,000 uh, to move into a new space. And I want to know if you will vote to give Vera money um, towards this capital uh, project improvement projects in the next uh, round of the budget. Well, I think last year's allocation was $25,000. Vera is a thriving downtown club. Yes or no? Yes or no. Oh, yes no. Yes, yes or no. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yes. I got distracted. Yes. 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 Linda. Hot, hot potato. Yes. 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 Yes, I will, yes. Yes, I've always supported Vera. Wow. <laughs> Very good. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, right now it is my honor to introduce Glenn Lorbecki, who in addition to being a Recording Academy trustee is also the owner of Glenn Sound Studio. Many of you probably know him. And he is going to lead with the next question for our panelists. We're going to begin the questioning with Linda on this end, and we're going to go down this row, and then we're going to begin with Richard, with Robert in that corner, and come back around this end. Sorry. I'm going to read this very carefully off the page so as not to miss any important verbs. Mayor Nichols has been promoting the idea of Seattle as a great live music city. The city of Seattle recently released an economic impact study on the music industry showing that the music industry here is one of the top economic clusters in the city and generates over 1.3 billion, with a B, billion dollars in economic activity annually. <clears throat> Other industries receive tax, bre tax breaks and incentives and specifically, the film industry gets filming permits for about $25. But to put on a music festival in Seattle, the permits alone cost thousands of dollars. In regard to the mayor's idea of becoming a great music city and the music industry's impact on our local economy, multi-part question here, what would you do to change barriers to doing music business in Seattle, such as the cost of festival permits, and what would you do to encourage growth in our music industry? Furthermore, do you believe it's important to create an environment where music festivals and live music is far more welcome and much less of a financial burden? Linda. Candidates, let me give you just a second to think about that question. Um, and please try to stick within the two minute rule here. I know it's a long question and I'm sure you all have very thoughtful answers. But we are going to start with you now, Linda. Okay. Can I find out where the timekeeper is? There you are. Okay, great. Um, first, actually, let me introduce myself to, uh, my name is Linda Averill. I'm running for position number four, which is currently held by Jan Drago. I'm a Metro bus driver and a journalist for the Freedom Socialist newspaper. Um, I've lived in this city all my life and I've seen some really serious changes and most of them are not good. And I think that they're changes that are not conducive to the growth of a real grassroots music industry. I mean, this city has a very proud history. We were, um, you know, the founder of the grunge whole upsurge. Um, I remember going to the Paramount Theater and seeing Patti Smith for $2 as part of the Rising Star concert, which you could afford back in the 1980s. And so I think that the city should be providing a lot more of those kinds of really affordable um, festivals, um, shows, all of that. Um, I do want to get back to the rent control because I think that's a serious issue. Rents are becoming so high in Seattle 
that the clubs are forced to charge higher fare or higher, um, that's my bus driver thing coming out, higher fees to get in. Um, also, um, so I think number one, yes, absolutely, we should be funding more festivals. And those festivals should be affordable to everyone. Another thing we should do is um, put money into programs for young people, especially in the South End, to help um, give them a foot into the music industry because that's how you're going to provide new blood and the kind of um, you know, new ideas and new creativity that is going to make Seattle actually a, a vibrant music industry. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Angel, we'll go to you now, please. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, some people call me Angel. Uh, I'm all right with that. Uh, you can call me Angel Bolanos or Angel Bolanos, and I'm running for position number four as well. And uh, I, would, I wouldn't support uh, subsidies for the billionaires. I would be very, very supportive to every artist and a musician in Seattle. And believe me, when I say so, I mean it. Uh, one of the things that I would like to, to point that out is that one of the issues in my platform is to help out small business. Small business are my passion because they create the healthy economy and we need more jobs because, of, because you guys put out lots, lots of small jobs. And I believe one of the things that we have to focus on is helping to the streamline with the permitting process in Seattle as well as the state is a very tough uh, issue going to the permitting process and I believe we have to relax uh, fees and we have to help a small business to put up uh, any concerts that you as artists and, and help other people to show their culture and the, the, the art in here would be thinking of. So one of the things that I would truly, truly like to do is making sure that any subsidy goes to the art and to the musicians in Seattle. Richard, we're gonna go to you now. Thank you very much. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Richard Conlon, and I'm currently in position two on the city council. Uh, I know a lot about this particular issue. In fact, about two months ago, Dave Minert called me about uh, permit and insurance issues related to the Capitol Hill block party. Uh, it's a very significant issue. I want to tell you about some of the things that we've done and some of the things that I think can be done. First of all, let me say that having an office of music and film is really a significant change. Uh, it used to be just a film office. We've added the music to it. And we now have somebody from the music community, James Keblis, former director of Vera Project, who is now the director of the office of music and film. That's a good thing. And that's going to help redress, give us that balance and get some things going. Secondly, I want to talk about the ticket revenues. Uh, in the past, we've not had a very good stable source of funding for arts. Uh, under legislation that we passed about four years ago, about 20% of our ticket tax revenues is now dedicated to arts. That's something that I suggested and recommended to the council, and we actually adopted that. Uh, and uh, it's something that I think we should be putting more emphasis into music, as well as into some of the things that uh, we have been supporting, like live theater, which is certainly a good thing. Thirdly, I want to mention the Vera Project. Vera Project, when it first came to the city council, um, I was one of the people who sponsored making sure that we got the Vera Project some attention and some effort. We need to make sure it has a venue. Um, I strongly support the idea of the venue at Seattle Center, and uh, I'm working to try and make sure that we do have some provisions for funding that in the budget. Another thing I want to comment on, I've got 30 seconds to go, so I'll try and move really fast, is the All Ages Dance Ordinance, which was a regulatory system in the past, we had real problems in having venues that uh, teenagers and people under 21 could access. The All Ages Dance Ordinance, which I sponsored on the city council, took care of that regulatory thing. There's some other regulatory things we can do to change. And let me mention finally that we also have some things that we haven't done yet, one of which is we can create a pool for insurance that will help provide insurance for venues and events. And I think that would be something that would be really helpful to a lot of the small venues and events. Thank you, Richard. Nice way to wrap it up at the end there. Let me remind all the candidates that your biographies do appear here. And let me remind the audience if you have questions about uh, their backgrounds and everything. This sheet will also point out who the incumbents are on the panel here, so you don't need to waste your time introducing yourselves. Casey, we'll go to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I look at this issue as um, 
Keeping in mind that music in Seattle is an industry that employs nearly 9,000 people with about a billion dollars a year in revenue. I mean, it's a staggering amount of money, so this is a huge focus of Seattle's economy. Second is that the music industry is a collect, it's a community. It's a, it's a collection of organizations and it's a collection of individuals who are trying to make it and they're trying to uh, express themselves. I, uh, in one of my past lives, I was the theater critic at the Seattle PI, so I'm familiar with the theater uh, community, and I've been an author. I've written two books, so I know a little bit about what, it, what it's like to sit in a room to try to create something. Um, but fundamentally, what the city should do is look at the continuum of services that we need to provide to support all of our artists in this city. And it starts with schools. We need good schools that are adequately funded, that um, provide for music education in the city. We are slowly draining all of the dollars out of music education. It's about zoning, it's about providing venues, it's about a sensible tax climate. There's a million things the city should do. Fundamentally, we should support the music community and be a partner, not a problem. Government doesn't invent creativity, but they should support it. Casey, quick question. Is uh, the school issue, does that fall under the purview of the city council? No, the city uh, does not run the schools, but we have a crisis in the Seattle school system, and the mayor and the council cannot stand on the sidelines when we have a community in crisis. We must help the schools. I have a comprehensive plan on my website, caseycore.com. I'm the only candidate in this race who's put forward anything more than a short-term solution. We all have an interest in the future of kids in Seattle. Thank you. Jan, we'll go to you next, please. Hey, Jan Drago. Uh, I think the hallmark of my time on Seattle City Council has been economic development and job creation. For all of the years that I've been on the council, I've had the liaison with our Department of Economic Development, and included in that is the Office of Tourism and Film. And I worked with um, Dave and Deborah and strategized how to create the Office of Music. Um, I, you mentioned the $25 film permit. I worked with that office when the, there was a time when we were filming a lot of films in Seattle, and then the value of the dollar changed, and they went to Canada, and we had to compete. So we did lower permit fees and we did everything we could to help the film industry compete. So your question was, what would you do to help the music industry? And I would say that I would work as hard as I've worked with the Office of Film, working with the Office of Film Now and Music to make sure that the music industry can compete. It is a huge piece of our economy. Um, I worked with them in terms of doing the economic development study uh, that produced the results that it did, the music website, all of those things. Nick and I kind of split responsibility. He has the artistic side, I have the economic development side. And clearly, you got to bring the money in before you can spend it. Thank Jan, you, would Jan. You, I'm sorry, is, do sorry. I have time for a quick question? You do. Um, <clears throat> would you consider your work with the, with the film community to be a big success? Absolutely. And tourism, I just talked to somebody in Pioneer Square today and said, how are things going this summer? Said, we're up 12% for June, 18% for May, and he gave credit to a lot of it to um, the cruise industry. And we work very, very hard to make that happen. And that, actually, he owns a club in Seattle, a music club. In oh, Dan, that signals you are done. No, I thought about wow. it. I made a great point. <laughs> that was dramatic, Kurt. I'm impressed. All right. Well, that woke everyone up. Okay, we're going to jump up to the top tier here, and we're going to go to you, Robert. Start on your end. I'm Robert Rosencrantz. A big part of my campaign <clears throat> is about affordability. And when you look at the fact that the 9,000 people whose almost full-time avocation is music and art and see that their average income is $22,000, you can imagine that as Seattle becomes a more and more expensive place, what's going to happen is there, 
they're not going to be able to hang on to living in the city anymore. And that would be a shame and that would be wrong. There are a couple of things I've proposed uh, in order to address that. The first is the artistic community and the creative community needs access to the, to the latest tools. One of them is broadband. We know we currently have a contract with Comcast and a couple others that provides fairly high priced internet, uh, fast internet service. The city needs to take the initiative to lack, latch on to the next public utility broadband and keep it affordable for people who otherwise would be priced out of that market. The second thing we need to do is to make sure that housing affordability remains in place in the city and that we don't become this divided city between the very wealthy and the very low income. I've, I've worked in affordable housing and housing over the past 21 years and have played a direct role in pre creating or preserving over a thousand units of, most of it low income housing, but in any case, uh, what, excuse me, affordable housing. We need to make the commitment to make sure we don't hollow out those in the middle and leave us at the top and the bottom. In terms of what the city can do, the permitting process, we need to view the arts community, we need to, to view many of the communities that come to the city in good faith as our partners and as opportunities instead of as problems. We need to change the culture of those who are, who are often issuing the permits and to make sure they understand that we have to be sensitive to the fact that these are our customers and to make sure the process is fair, balanced, and even-handed. Thank you, Robert. Dwight? I, I gotta tell you, this is kind of a uh, tough format because they ask a question and then we sit up here and wait for six people to say, I got something clever to say about this, but I'm worried that somebody in front of me is gonna make my clever point. And I kind of feel like watching the NBA draft last night with those guys sitting around hoping they get drafted by the Knicks. Um, I think the question that you're asking, though, is about economic development, and it's about the music industry having parity with other industries. You know, we all know that the Boeing Company, the legislature said, well, we got jobs here, so we're going to subsidize the industry, and we're going to put this big package of incentives together to get Boeing to come here. The Port of Seattle uh, put together facilities so the cruise ships could dock. Okay, and they, they put money into that. And the question is, why is it if this industry is creating jobs, is the city's response to tax it rather than to incentivize it? Why is, why is the music industry treated different than other industries that we incentivize? And I think that that's what the city needs to do. They need to get a consistent economic development policy that if we're incentivizing film because it brings jobs and industry, and if we're incentivizing the cruise ships, music wants to be treated on the same level. There has to be an analysis of what the industry brings in, an analysis of what the precedent is in terms of subsidizing other industries, and then decide whether a pool of funds should be created uh, for the music industry. And that pool of fund then might be used to drive down the cost of the licensing on festivals as a form of incentive, or drive down the fees that bumper shoot faces, for example as a form of incentive. It's asking that this industry be treated on a par with other industries in terms of economic development. Thank you, Dwight. Richard, we're going to go to you now, please. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to be unique. After all that. <laughs> I, think, I think everybody has sort of offered some good suggestions. I think a couple of things that we can do, though, I think one is we need to start working with the established groups who represent music around the city. We need to talk about what are the needs of music and identify what those are and what the disparities are. We also then need to look at things like the 1% for the arts. Maybe it ought to be raised and maybe it ought to be expanded to include music. That could provide something. The other thing we could do is create a public development authority. A public development authority that would work with all of the music venues in town and help figure out which ones need to be subsidized, very much like we do housing for various income groups. We can create patterns and practices of how to help them know what the difference between market and making the nut is and losing and figure out those things so that we can figure out where to reduce those prices. Finally, I think we can do things as we have done. Uh, we've reduced permit fees, for instance, just recently for, I think, the Fremont Fair. Uh, so a lot of the neighborhood fairs will be able to do things at reduced costs. Um, we've taken off the, what would you call them? I guess the fees for selling secondary tickets. What do you call that? Scalping. Got it. Um, 
the other thing that I think we have not explored may be the things that we do already with, with art and housing. We've created work, work places where you can live work for artists. If noise is a problem, why can't we do the same kind of thing with the music community? That would give you a place to start, it would give you a place to expand, and give you a venue with which you can share with the rest of the people that do similar kinds of things, provide you housing at lower cost, provide you a rehearsal space, and as you grow out of the economics of that place, move on. Thank you, Richard. Darlene, we're at you now, please. I want you to know that I, I went to the um, website of the Office of Film and Music and I downloaded the economic um, impact study that was done. And I read the whole thing. I, I became very educated about the, how important this industry is. Uh, not only it, was it uh, one, over one billion in money that's brought in, but let me tell you about the number of jobs which got me. There are 10,700 jobs of 300 businesses, 3,000 businesses, and those are mostly small businesses. And that's 266 million in labor income alone. So it is a critical, your industry is a critical economic driver in this city. It's just not um, seen that way by such groups as the, uh, the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. And tonight, tonight before I came here, I talked to Steve Leahy, who's president of the Seattle Chamber. And I asked him, I'm going to send him this study. I told him he needed to read it. And I asked him, has there, the Seattle Chamber has always done city to city um, exchanges where they go and they, they look at transportation, they look at housing. They've never had one where they've looked at the music cluster of businesses. And he promised me that he would look at that. So I think that that's critically important. As far as the permits go, we need to have flexible permits where if people look at, on a sliding scale, the permit needs to look at the size of the organization, the size of their uh, budget, and who's involved. It's also a quality of life issue, not just an economic development issue, but it's clearly a quality of life issue in this uh, city of Seattle for me. Thank you, Darlene. Nick, we're going to end with you on this question. Um, you asked three questions on how we can make the music industry more vibrant in Seattle. The first was you asked, how can we cut costs? Um, we need to review the permit process. Permits should only cover the city's costs. They shouldn't be a revenue generator. And we have not reviewed them. We should review them. I wrote the legislation that allowed for a sliding scale so that local filmmakers would be charged a, a very, very small amount. We needed the same thing with the music industry. You also asked regarding how do we encourage growth. Currently, there's 27 public spaces downtown that were provided because we gave additional benefits to builders to go higher or build, bulk up. We need to use those public spaces so that this way the music industry can use them. Make sure that in the future when we have public spaces, there's electrical outlets. Make sure there's some money for programming. Work with the Parks Department. Work with the uh, Office of Film and Music so that they, we can actually, why not have a battle of the bands in the parks and downtown? Why not videotape it and then run it on the Seattle channel so people can watch something besides ourselves? <laughs> um, so that's how you encourage growth. Also, regarding how the benefits or burdens of concerts. Concerts are definitely a benefit. Um, we need to look at the public venues right now that we have and how we can better use them. Westlake uh, Mall, for instance, there was an agreement that we could close Pine Street from time to time. It's rarely been closed. We ought to think about when we could close it to actually have a massive event downtown in the Westlake Mall around music. Why not look at easing street permits, for instance, on the Capitol Hill Festival and other areas? And lastly, what we need to do is uh, basically make sure that you have leaders that are willing to stand out. I testified before the liquor board to allow minors to attend a live music events in establishments that have liquor control. And I was the well, there was only one other politician that showed up, and that was Mark Sidrick. So I'm willing, to be, I'm willing to go out, and I'm willing to testify and work for you. Ooh, you just made it in the nick of time there, Mr. Licata. All right, we have our lightning round, and Glenn is going to pose a question. Again, this is a yes or no answer. We're going to go in the exact same order that we just did the, that round with, starting with you, Linda, and work our way up. 
You know, it's interesting in, in all of your very eloquent answers, uh, there was quite a bit of talk about subsidies, but really no indication of where that subsidy would come from. Uh, the lightning round question pushes that a little farther, and I swear I didn't get together with Dwight on this question. The question is, yes or no, would you support tax breaks for music-related businesses? Yes or no, Linda? Can I ask how big those businesses are? No. I assume they're not that big. No, I mean, yes, I would support tax breaks for small businesses. Actually, I did mention that in, instead of financing mega yes or no. billionaires, yes. Yes I or would no. Lightning yes. round. Yes. yes. Thank you. I just you. wanted to point it out that I did mention, mention it. <laughs> Glenn, would you pose the question one more time? Let me remind the candidates it is a yes or no answer. Would you support tax breaks for music-related businesses? Yes. 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 Excellent. That's great. Well done. All right. Fast We've got. Thank a, you. Are you? Are you yeah. We've got one final question that's going to be posed to the panel of candidates. Uh, we're going to start in the order of beginning with Nick and coming around this way this time. Let me remind everyone that there is a two-minute time. If you get cut off, it is not a partisan cutoff. The panel of questionnaires are a nonpartisan group of people. The DJ is a nonpartisan DJ. <laughs> I am a nonpartisan MC. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Kate Becker, who many of you know is a longtime all ages activist, <laughs> interim director of the Vera Project. Seattle property values have increased exponentially over the last 25 years. As late as the mid-80s, Belltown and Pioneer Square were relatively undeveloped, with many vacant buildings and only a few high-dollar condominiums starting to take root. Rehearsal spaces, galleries, and musical venues flourished in these neighborhoods and elsewhere in the city. The economic barriers to starting a band, operating a venue, building a rehearsal space, or putting on a show were very low and helped create the climate within which Seattle musicians brewed and fermented what was to become one of the great worldwide pop culture phenomena of the last 30 years commonly referred to as grunge. Current property values preclude this scenario from being repeated anytime soon. Musicians who need cheap, abundant space to develop their work are fleeing town for Tacoma, Portland, and other less expensive cities. What happens to our city if we price out all the musicians? And what role, if any, should the city play in making sure musicians have places to create, perform, and display their work without intense financial pressure? Again, we're going to start with Nick. And I know there are a lot of people on the, on the panel here, and it's hard to have an original answer. So we're all with you. OK. Um, one of the key things to uh, doing your work is having a place to work other than just performing. So therefore, you need rehearsal space, just like artists need studio space. One of the things we need to think about is how do we get the rehearsal space for, group, for uh, music, for bands? We need to take a look at how the city can cooperate with private owners who have spaces that aren't used. Is there a way that we can provide an incentive for a person whose building is vacant or uh, will be vacant? to uh, provide them some tax incentives to allow it to open it up for a rehearsal space. Can, why not the city look at an investment in the, some of the spaces we own to basically um, allow, at low cost, bands to come in to use that rehearsal space? Or look at double usage of some of the existing public spaces we have for rehearsal space. Prime example is City Hall. We have what we hope to be a, eventually a uh, cultural cafe. Why not have a rehearsal space for bands right in City Hall? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's going to go big. <laughs> well, on that note, Darlene, we're going to go to you. Right. OK. Um, Nick, you had some great ideas. Um, I think that we need to look at this whole uh, cultural and uh, music theme holistically in this city and see what buildings are, are being used for what purposes. 
and that we get everyone together and in a way that they can exchange the space that they have, the time that they have, the facilities they have, and come up with a sort of uh, directory. And it can be looked at at who's doing what and what would benefit to have someone else in there in the space to be used. And I think it would be synergistic for the whole uh, cultural movement in this city as a whole. And so that's what I would bring is to look at something holistically and see what we have and see what we can mix it up with. Thank you. Richard? Thank you. Um, that's why I go back to when I talked earlier about a public development authority. You know, we actually re redid the Pike Market 60 years ago with a public development authority. I'm not sure that we couldn't do the same kind of model and create an authority that could in fact purchase or build or buy with low cost, low interest or no interest, tax exempt bond issues that we could capitalize the authority with. Look at renting that space out on a sliding scale basis that would be operated by the Public Development Authority that may require some subsidy for a few first few years. We need to determine that feasibility of that. If it works, we'd then know what kind of income we'd need to pay off those bonds. And we'd be able to provide what I think would be a low cost way of putting a high quality venue together and keeping it operating through its own activities and letting that become a genesis for a lot of the music issues that we're having today. Thank you. Dwight, we're gonna go to you now, please. Um, I, the uh, issue of rising property values in Seattle, as you say, it affects housing and it affects the issue of, uh, of, of, of uh, practice space for musicians. And I think the analogy is appropriate because the market is gonna dominate for the most part. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately. In the housing uh, sector, the government is able to subsidize some housing and help some people out, uh, but not everybody. A lot of people are still subject to the market, as I'm sure most of the people in this room are. You take Tashiro Kaplan, for example. Tashiro Kaplan took a, is, was an attempt to, to deal with the difficult issue of, uh, work, of housing for artists. Tashiro Kaplan created 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 units of artist housing and that was uh, a, an assistance by the government on the question, but there's still hundreds and hundreds of artists who aren't uh, eligible for that subsidized workspace. So the question is, what is it that we can do for the government to help artists, understanding that if there's dozens, if not hundreds of bands, and I don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I assume there's dozens or hundreds of bands out there that are suffering from this issue. We're not gonna find subsidized uh, space for all those bands, but we could do something along the line of perhaps an adult Vera project uh, that was some kind of an incubator concept that had some funds and had a governing board and made a decision of what was affordable in terms of subsidizing the issue of space to assist uh, young uh, bands and young artists to get started. Thank you, Dwight. Robert? Well, I'm going to directly answer the, one of those questions. What will happen if we price out artists in Seattle? We won't be Seattle anymore. I mean, we'll become the kind of homogenous you know, area that loses much of its vibrancy. And that'd be a shame because I, this is where I grew up and the place I love. And part of what I love is the fact that there is so much creative energy and so many pe people pursuing that creativity with a raw passion. 20 years ago, 1985, I saw that as the city mature, not mature, as, as artists became those leading indicators of what the next development wave was going to be. We were going to find the kind of property price escalation that other places like San Francisco were experiencing. That's when I embarked on this quest to try and preserve as much of that at a higher degree of affordability for lower incomes. I had some success, but one of the reasons I'm running for a city council is that vision I had 20 years ago, it was on the mark. And the city council and the city took some steps to capitalize using limited resources in terms of preserving both the opportunities for housing and the opportunity for practice space, but not enough. And I want to bring the vision and creativity and energy that I have and have put into use over the past 20 years and make sure that those who would otherwise fall through the cracks and would ultimately wind up drifting away from Seattle because it's not affordable anymore can stay in the city and continue to provide the kind of pollination for 
all kinds of economic development and the artistic scene that's going to make this the place that, where I want to grow old in and where I bet all of you do too. Thank you. Jan? Well, I like the ideas I've heard from um, Nick, in particular Richard, um, Dwight, and Robert, and I'm just going to build on that. These are the things that I think are um, within the realm of what we actually could do. And that's workforce housing for musicians and incorporate that as an incubator. Uh, and look at Georgetown. Look what's happening in Georgetown as workforce of, and studio for artists. And there's plenty more vacant space there that seems to me would be just perfect for musicians and to make that an incubator. The other thing is, I've worked for years and years with our Office of Economic Development to create a film studio at Sandpoint. And we just have not been able to do that. Uh, it just doesn't, in the developer's terms, pencil out. But what about if we created a film studio and a rehearsal space? Combine that, maybe it would pencil out, and maybe that's something that we could do. Thank you, Jan. Casey? I think this is a really good question that was put in front of us. What happens to our city if we price out all of our musicians? Well, what happens to our city if we price out all but the rich? What happens to our city if the city council keeps borrowing and borrowing and now they're beyond 800 billion million in debt? What happens to our city if good schools close? What happens to our city if the monorail borrows 12 or 11 billion dollars and sends 9 billion of that to New York City bond lawyers? These are the questions we need to face. The answer to housing is the market. We need to increase density around our emerging transit hubs. The answer to our spending and tax burden policies is consider the small business owner the musician and others who are being taxed and priced out of this city. We need common sense policies on our taxation, our utility rates. We need to keep in mind this is a very expensive city and government has to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Thank you, Casey. Richard, we're gonna go to you now. Okay, well, the basic problem we have is that you know, we don't create any more land. The land is being occupied by high val higher value uses than it used to be. And we used to be able to create land. We built Harbor Island because we wanted a port. We washed down the Denny Regrade and made the waterfront. But we're not doing that anymore. So the question is, how can we turn this problem into a solution or into an opportunity? What we're getting is a fair amount of wealth in this city. And what we should be able to do is to tap that wealth in creative ways in order to be able to support the things that keep our city alive. The things like music, the things like art, the things that make the city, that give the city its spirit. So I have an idea on that. First of all, we don't want to be like St. Louis or Detroit or places like that where the property values are really low because that's a problem too. What we want to be is a place where we take those property values and take advantage of them to foster that spirit. In 2007, we will be renewing the community center's Seattle Center levy. In the past, that has supported neighborhood community centers and development at the Seattle Center. I think we should expand our definition of community centers so that when we renew that levy, we think about community centers as arts venues, as music venues, as places where people get together to experience all the aspects of community, not just the sort of gym and swim things that we sometimes think of as community centers. So there's an opportunity that's concrete, that's specific, that we can tap into, and we can say right now that this is a goal that we're going to have for the renewal of that levy. And the reason we should be doing that, and by the way, we should be doing that with our existing community centers and venues as well. For example, at Sandpoint, we've got lots of buildings that could be used for these kind of purposes. The reason we should be doing that is because arts is not just economic, Arts is a part of spirit and community, and that's what makes Seattle great. Thank you, Richard. Richard, I think you have an internal stopwatch going on because you have come dangerously close each time to getting gonged. Angel, we're going to go with you now, please. Well, thank you very much for the question. 
Uh, we are experiencing proper tax going so high up, and the value of the housing is so big. In order to solve the problem we, uh, that artists and musicians are having, I would like to see the taxation from hotels and motels going directly to you, rather than to finance stadiums or key arena or anything else. And somebody, somebody has to come up with morality because the city council right now, some of them are immorally irresponsible about financial, uh, financial situations. We have to be, bring back the government and we have to open up every school, every community center so you can rehearsal all the time and with fees that are okay to your packets. Do, those things we have to focus on. And the idea of Nick is great to open up the city hall, but the problem is parking. Parking is a big issue and nobody talks about it. We have to make sure that we holistically approach solving the problem, not creating more problems. And I propose that we have to open up every school and create a dynamic school so my child, your children, your grandchildren, if, uh, if you have children, can have the opportunity to get immersed in music, in art, in culture. That is the community that we have to focus on. Because if we become so greedy and just subsidize the millionaires and billionaires in town, we are not going to be living in a society that we all want to express ourselves with the freedom that we were born to express. Thank you. Thank you. Linda, we're going to end this question with you. Okay, I've had lots of time to take notes, so I guess it's unfair. But I hope you guys are taking notes tonight because I think you've been fed a lot of promises and platitudes. And when it comes election time, and these guys, you know, whoever gets elected, hold them to it. Um, affordable housing, a lot of people have thrown that term around tonight. Um, the affordable housing that they granted a tax exemption for Paul Allen in South Lake Union, you have to make $14 an hour. This is the definition of affordable housing in this city, so I think we need to raise the minimum wage to be commensurate with what the city defer, de term, or defines as affordable housing. Three, people really haven't talked about where all this tax money is going to come from. We need to tax the corporations. We have one of the most regressive tax systems in the entire country, and we need to start looking at it. People can talk about all kinds of things, but until we start going after the big guys like Microsoft, Weyerhaeuser, Boeing, nothing in this um, state or city is going to change. Um, and that is how you're going to fund all these youth programs, these public spaces, all these open spaces that the city council members and other candidates have promised you tonight. Um, number five, um, you know, some of the very folks who are talking about providing more subsidies for the music industry voted to give Paul Allen 45 million for his South Lake Union streetcar. So where is the line? I mean, I took a quote, tap wealth in creative ways to keep arts alive. We're tapping wealth and then giving it to the wealthy is what we're really doing. Um, finally, on density, yeah, we need density, but we need it not at the expense of living quality. I think that what the city council did on raising density in Capitol Hill and giving the developers everything they wanted with nothing in return was really, um, I think they need to, these counselors need to uh, hear from you. Oh, wah, wah. Nice. Thank you very much. Before we go to the last lightning round question, um, I just wanted to thank the candidates for all being here. You've all... I think there have been some very uh, exciting opinions, clearly some very passionate thought on stage tonight, and I do hope that everyone appreciates it. So, thank you. And Kate, you have the final lightning round question. Reminder, yes or no? All ages shows are currently legal at all hours. Do you think there should be age limits for concerts or shows that go past 10 o'clock? Okay, we are going to start with Linda. We're going to move around that way. No. Me? Angel? No. 
No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. No. The lightning round is kind of boring. Come on. Hey, come on. You guys can do better than that. Well, you need you? to ask more interesting questions. Yeah, come on. Monorail, yes or no? <laughs> Go for it. TDL. <laughs> okay. Um, before we get to the audience questions part of the evening, I would like to remind everyone that there is a Meet the Candidates reception upstairs afterwards. We have some snacks for you. We have some complimentary beer because Miller High Life supports the Seattle music community. Um, but right now I'm going to introduce Ben London, who you already know, and Dave Minert. They've got some questions from the audience, and they're going to pose them to the panel to a specific candidate. This is not a... Oh, you'll be doing groupings. I'm going to let Ben explain. What we're going to do is we're going to break from the format that we've been doing, because we feel that you've seen all 12 of them answer the same questions. So to get to we uh, A, thank you for all the questions that brought forth. This is really great. And if we don't get to them, I apologize. But please go ask the candidates individually. So we're going to ask them in groupings of two or three. So this question is, um, what is important for you to say to Comcast officials when negotiating for better broadband access? What do you think about classifying high-speed internet as a public utility? And let's start with Nick on this one. Uh, I think it would be great if we could uh, classify uh, high-speed as a public utility. Um, we, unfortunately, the city has to operate within the federal and state restrictions, but we should push the envelope as far as possible. Great. Um, Casey? You're talking about seizing Comcast and converting it into a public utility? Um, this, well, I'm not saying that. This is the question coming from the audience, but the, they were wanting to know about should the concept of broadband become a public utility rather than something that private individuals um, well, run? Um, I, I've written two books on uh, telecommunications, uh, one on the Bullitt family, one on um, the cellular industry. I th the, there was a recent Supreme Court decision on this, and I think that they should have classified uh, cable companies as telecommunication providers where there's access and there's choice. Um, for, for a lot of us, including in my own home, that's the only choice I have for broadband internet access. And in a modern economy, access to the internet is access to our democracy and information that we all need. But if the question is, should we seize it? I, 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 don't, I don't think that's the presumption of the question. But should it be, be open because it's a necessary utility? Don't forget, Comcast got into our helms through agreements with local governments where they strung their line on public lines or through public uh, wiring underground. Um, they got in it through a public permission that we shouldn't let them off the hook. Great. And uh, Robert Rosencrantz. Thank you. In about 10 days on www.robertrosencrantz.com, you'll find my white paper on broadband internet access. The answer to your question is a resounding yes, and this is one of the centerpieces of my campaign. We don't have to seize Comcast. There are many opportunities for distributing high-speed access at very low cost. I mean, SeattleWireless.net is doing a terrific job, and Matt Westerveld and crew deserve a huge degree of credit for having found the opportunities in the marketplace and used them at a very low cost to distribute access to those who otherwise would be priced out of the market. It needs to be a public utility. We need to show the same courage on this issue that city showed 100 years ago at, at the Cedar River watershed to make sure our water supply was permanently a public utility to which we would forever have access. We can't shy away from this one. It takes business sense, common sense, and it'll take a lot of courage. We have to do it. Casey, go ahead. Casey, if you want to. I, I just want to follow up my point. If, if there's an entrepreneur out there that's providing a low cost service, yes, should we, support, we should support that. But if we're talking about taking over a company and turning it into a new city light, which is not a model of outstanding management, that's the wrong direction. We want to support entrepreneurs, not take them over. OK, thanks. Um, next question, uh, European, Canadian, and other governments provide direct subsidies to new artists, including musicians and bands, for things like recording, touring, um, uh, touring support. Can Seattle do anything similar? Um, Jan Drago. I don't think so. I think our state laws prohibit that. We're really boxed in. I mean, we, there's a lot of things that we can't do. We can't offer um, direct tax incentives to businesses to relocate here. So I, I'm not positive, but I seriously doubt that we can do it. 
Um, Darlene Maidenwald. I think, I think Jan is right. Um, I, I don't know it in detail, but there are a lot of things that Canada does do that I think we can use in models of how healthcare, for example, of, of uh, how we can see if we couldn't model some of our things that we do, and this may be one of them, uh, it, as we know more about it. But there's some things that Canada does with their citizens that we could learn a lot from. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, there's four people left, so this is your question. Um, this is a long question that someone wrote, so I'll just read it. Let's be realistic. You've all got great ideas supporting art and subsidizing venues and housing artists, but all of this costs money. How realistically are you going to make any of this happen when there are so many other priorities? Police protection, human services, and transportation. You've made a lot of promises. Can you, uh, here in front of these people, but can you keep uh, these promises in front of another audience? Um, Richard Conlon. Well, the answer is that, yes, we have to be careful with the, uh, the funds that we are entrusted with by the voters, uh, but there are opportunities for us. One of the opportunities, and this is, again, the sort of thing of turning a problem into, a, into an opportunity. One of the opportunities that's present to us is the real estate excise tax. Because prices are so high and because the market is so hot, we are realizing many, much more uh, real estate excise tax revenues, which is the tax on uh, transfer of properties, than we have in the past. We had $5 million extra dollars last year that were unbudgeted. We expect to have probably more than that this year. And by the way, a lot of this doesn't come just from things like sale of houses. A lot of it is coming from people purchasing downtown buildings. When somebody buys a downtown building for $90 million, that gives the city about $500,000 in real estate excise tax that may not be budgeted. So those are the kind of things that we should be looking at, ways in which we can tap into the wealth that's coming into this community and use it to support the things that we really need to uh, or want to be able to do. Secondly, we really need to trust the voters. Uh, the voters of this city have been extremely generous in voting for things like parks and libraries and community centers, uh, fire stations. If you put a good program in front of the voters and recognize, most, as most voters do, that it's a relatively modest cost for each individual homeowner, voters tend to support property tax increases for important things in this city. So I think that's something that we need to uh, also keep in mind as we look at what the prospects are. So the bottom line is, yes, we need to be careful, but yes, there are also opportunities. Uh, just to mention a couple of other quick ones, uh, we talked about subsidies for the music industry. One of the things we can do is change the rates in our B&O tax, and that's one way in which you could do subsidies. Uh, that could be done by industry or commercial classification. And finally, let me just mention the 20% of admission tax that's dedicated to arts. That's something that could be used for music in a lot of different ways. Good timing, Richard. Angel. Thank you. As a person who supports quite passionately small business, I believe we have to find a ways responsibly to subsidize the arts and the musicians. Uh, I believe it, it can be done by just being responsible, fiscally responsible, putting the money that is being allocated for the very, very rich in town and put it on what we must put in order to survive, in order to make this community alive, in order to make this community vibrant. And, and I think it is very, very important that we do understand that we do not have a local government responsible, fiscally responsible, in order to make such decisions. And I have been very outspoken, I will always be outspoken, in regard to making sure that the money goes where it's most needed. We can tackle the issue that be on all taxes and help that way to, to the small business musicians and, uh, and, and the artists. We have to create, we have to, be, we have to be visionary in order to really support the, communi the communities that need the most. So by, by tackling directly to, to the billionaires, I think we can easily subsidize the, 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 the small groups. If we do that, I, I believe we can create a tremendous vibrant econo economy in every, in every town, in every, in every neighborhood. And uh, we have to make sure that all those ideas are put into place and not just promises and promises so you can vote for me. I promise you 
that any other person can be more spoken than I am. And I will be making sure that the subsidy goes into place. All right, one last question for the three people left. Um, what, if you're elected or re-elected, what specific uh, piece of legislation that you would consider pro-music would you bring forward to the council and try to get passed? Um, Richard McIver. Thank you. You know, I'm not sure, but let me give you some ideas because they came up tonight, and thank you for this. We're going to hold you to this. I, um, I think we could look at creating a PDA and creating something that could become the umbrella under which we could do the music venues. I also believe that the Vera project you asked about earlier and about contributions can come from some of that excess real estate excise tax Councilmember Conlon was talking about. I also don't see why if we can create a PDA and understand what the genesis of the issues are for music is, is that we could also figure out ways to do some tax exempt bonds that could help finance uh, a facility built by the PDAs. I think any one of those things, but I think starting with the PDA would make a lot of sense, and I think doing the, the REIT or real estate excise tax piece for a Vera uh, construction piece would work very, very well. Excellent. Um, Mr. Pels. Uh, well, my answer to this question sort of ties into the last question, which is how much um, subsidy can the council really afford for the music community? And, I, and it goes back to something I said earlier, which is I think the music community wants to be treated on a par with other industries, which is they want to, we've got this study now that says that there's $650 million in direct uh, payment in the industry, which generates a second $650 uh, of, of uh, residual activity for a $1.3 billion commit, uh, contribution to the local economy. So I think what the city's responsibility, city council's responsibility is to make a decision on the level of subsidy that this industry deserves and to be open with people about it, you know, and to compare that to other industries and, um, and uh, to have a, be accountable to the public on that discussion and the number that comes up with. So if I'm elected to the city council, I will uh, lead, lead an effort to have the city do an analysis of what the, uh, not only the impact for the music industry is, we have an, a, a preliminary number of $1.3 billion, but to make a decision on how much to subsidize the industry in response. We hear stuff about property taxes. We hear stuff about tax breaks. We hear about PDAs. Those all carry money with them. And, and, the, and the pot is not uh, open-ended. Uh, but what we need to do is have an open process by which we make a decision of what the value of the industry is and then we hold to that decision by creating a, a variety of economic devices such as subsidies or tax breaks to help the industry out. Thank you. Um, Linda, Linda Averill. Well, the one thing that I would really want to see um, as a city councilor would be to directly really give money to youth programs to help get young people started in the music industry and through apprenticeship programs, I mean, become an acoustical engineer or to be able to take the music that you learned in high school one step further, learn, the, um, you know, learn how to set up a band and how to market yourself. But in terms of um, the larger picture, I think it does get back to the question that Kate Becker asked, which is it gets back to a climate that is being created right now as we speak that is far different than the kind of climate that we had in the 1980s when Seattle was a much cheaper place to live. And the reality is, is that Mayor Nichols, and I'm sure many of the city councilors have followed this, have talked about how we're going to raise all these property taxes to bring in all this revenue and what, so that they can spend it on all these things. And what they don't talk about is that they are driving working and poor people out of this city. And so we really have to look at the policies that are geared towards benefiting the very rich right now. So that does get back to taxing the corporations. The um, legislature has like 300 plus loopholes 
for um, cor large corporations that they could close. So I think we need to lobby the legislature to get the money. I think we need to close the loopholes right here in Seattle, like the 11 billion for the monorail. I don't think we should be spending that money. Um, and then last is we need to go to the federal government and, and get some action against the war because that's another place where our money is being wasted. As well as, <laughs> 10 more seconds, um, cuts, uh, the cuts that Bush gave for the super wealthy. Thank you. Excellent. So we're going we're gonna to have one more lightning round of questions and then we're done. So here, here we go. Um, there's a smoking ban initiative that's out there right now. <clears throat> um, but it, it also says in that initiative that you cannot smoke within a certain distance from the entrances or exits of a building. So the war room could not have smoking on their deck. If you were at this club, you couldn't stand outside the club and smoke. Do you, are you for or against this particular smoking ban? Yes or no? We'll start with Linda. Question. Or, or sorry, or not yes or no, but for or against. Could you verify? Are you saying for the whole proposal or the part that talks about the entrances? This initiative, for or against? Uh, start with you, Linda. No. No. Well, I have to, I, I'm sorry, no, I can't yes. answer that one. <laughs> for or against? Yes, sir. Up say, or down? I'll say no based on your facts, but uh, I'm not sure those facts are correct. Oh, come on, Richard. Save Our facts lives. are always great. Save lives, kill smoke. No. No. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yes, I'm president of the American Lung Association of Washington. Uh-oh, we shouldn't have put you next to Richard. <laughs> Nick, final opinion. No. No. All right. Uh, you know what? We have a lot more audience questions that we're just not going to be able to get to, which is why we really strongly encourage you to come upstairs and you can meet the candidates face to face and ask them your questions. I would like to uh, thank the Recording Academy for hosting this event. For more information on the Recording Academy, please go to this table back here and you can get all kinds of information. Thanks again to the candidates for their time and their thoughtful answers this evening. Thank you to our wonderful panel. And thank you thank all you. for being here. It is extremely important to be involved with local politics. So thank you very much. Good night, Seattle.